I'm actually glad that Laura went before me because it's going to make understanding me a lot easier. <laughs> um, so we'll just go right into it. My name is Christopher Culbertson, uh, but in another world I'm known as Marcos Curiqueo in Ula. That is because when I was six months old, I was adopted from Chile, and both of my parents were of indigenous origin, and they're called the Mapuche. Not a lot of people know what the Mapuche are, so first I have to explain that. The Mapuche people and the Mapuche population make up about 4% of Chile's population. It's roughly about a million people. It could be more, we just don't know, because in the census is that in Chile, not a lot of people identify themselves as Mapuche due to a lot of racism and prejudice that they receive, both from the Chilean people, both from them, and from the Mapuche community itself. Of that population, about half live in urban areas such as Santiago. The other half live in communities or reservations that they were placed on during the 19th century, not 20th century. The 20th century, they were all placed on reservations in during a, a process called the pacification of the La Araucania, which was uh, a period in which the Chilean government seized the best Mapuche traditional land and moved all of the Mapuche onto reservations, kind of what happened in the US. Um, and so since then, the Mapuche people have been living both in urban areas such as Santiago, as well as urban areas of the communities. So, Kind of going off of what Laura was explaining, my freshman year I taught English in Chile for three months. After sophomore year I was back again working with an NGO. Uh, and after sophomore year I met my biological family, which is where I learned that my name is Marcos and uh, that I had these names. So identity has always been very interesting for me, especially Mapuche identity, especially within Chile. And so as I've grown up through college, I've really come, come to understand, to a degree, what it means to be Mapuche in Chile right now. So I've decided to do my talk on the cultural identity in Chile, looking at it through Mapuche poetry. While I was in Chile, I met this man whose name is Lorenzo Ayapan Gaileo. He is the bird man. He's a very interesting poet. Uh, Lorenzo Ayapan is very well known for using a lot of traditional aspects of Mapuche culture that come from what is called ul. Ul is, is a song, it's a canto. And a lot of people are split on whether the ul is poetry or whether ul is something else, that it's not part of the poetry. What he does is he writes out his poetry, but he also he can imitate every single bird in the south of Chile. Um, as part of my IS, I'll be writing a iBook which, in which I hope to add the audio so that people can hear what that sounds like. It's very interesting. Uh, and I had a chance to meet him, and we had a talk, and he read a poem. And he's like, I don't know if you've ever heard this bird. And I was like, wow, I've heard that bird. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and he went through a lot, and he knows really a lot of the connections and traditional uh, beliefs. He has a very interesting story himself. So that's kind of how I got into Mapuche poetry. And so, uh, that is that. So, when you look at Mapuche poetry, you start to see two different things. And I use traditional in quotes because um, I really don't believe in traditional and modern anymore. Using uh, a man named Garcia Canclini, who did work in Mexico, he argues for cultural hybridity in which modern and traditional exist simultaneously at the same exact time. What, to, what the Chilean government and what popular Chilean mentality likes to do is separate the two. So I use traditional poets to kind of help understand how these terms are being utilized. Um, the traditional poets are Lorenzo Ayapan, Leno Leon who I've met, Eli Kurochi Abuela, and Jaime Buenuni. Leno Lianlaf uh, was born in uh, 1969 in Villa Rica, which is closer to the mountains in Chile. Lorenzo Ayapan is from, let's see where is Ayapan is from the Araucania region, which is more in the coastal Puerto San Rey region. 
Uh, Wenlun is from Valdivia, which is also part of the coast. And Chia Huelaf is from Quechua Rewe, which is uh, Mapuche. They have their own language. Now, what's really interesting is that Mapudungu, the language of the Mapuche, is not written. It's, uh, it was never written. And it wasn't until the early 20th century when linguistics came down and started writing out the language. But the only, the only translations we have of the language is you know, the German idea of what it sounds like, <laughs> or the Italian idea of what it sounds like. So a lot of people who speak Mapudungu, if they read it, they wouldn't understand it because they've never seen it written. Uh, they don't know how to write it. It's, it's really difficult when it comes to analyzing poetry because it's hard to talk about because not only are you dealing with you know, poetry, but you're also dealing with another person's translation of what the poetry sounds like. So this is Ayapan giving a uh, class in Chile. The traditional poets are very celebrated in Chile. This is Chihuahua in Spain, there's Chihuahua in Paris, Wenun in London, and uh, Ayapan uh, somewhere in Asia. Um, and this is to show that the Chilean state really likes to celebrate the traditional poet. And what the traditional poet does is adhere to the patriotic Indian. It's part of the past. And what, what the Chilean government likes to kind of create is this mentality and idea that the Mapuche people no longer exist, that they're not part of our present, they're not part of our future, they're part of the past, and they're part of our glorious past. They're very much part of our identity, but in the history books, they don't exist anymore. Um, which is kind of also what's been happening in a lot of other areas. There's been a very long history of conflict between the two sides. Um, so of course, you have these poets who are very well known, a lot of people in Chile know them. But what a lot of people in Chile don't know are the Professors, I started to understand more of the themes that were arising 
within, when you look at the production and reception of Mapuche poetry, there are certain themes that you just can't ignore. There is geography, generation, language, and gender that you all that all create and are all factors when you look at Mapuche poetry. An urban poet is going to write very extremely differently than the rural poet. And that is because of language. The older poets, who are mostly from the rural areas, speak mostly Mapudungun. Mapudungun is a very difficult language. I've tried to learn it. It's extremely hard. Um, and so you can imagine that if they're writing their poetry in Mapudungun, there's a very small amount of people who are going to be able to read it. So a lot of times that poetry is translated into Spanish and then translated into English. Some poets offer their own translations from Mapudungun into Spanish. And I'm going to show you later a poem that kind of got me interested in this whole idea of poetry. Uh, the younger and older poets are also writing very differently. I think here's a younger poet, and he's writing very strong, very political poetry, whereas the older poets are writing more about the dreams of their ancestors and all of these beautiful images of the past and all these other things. So this is an example of, uh, on the left there is Mapudungu, and as you can see, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> On the right is the poem translated into English offered by the poet. Um, no, he offers his own translation in Spanish, and then uh, another person came in and offered the translation in English. This is the poem. This poem comes from a book. There aren't many books. There's probably about three that have Mapuche poetry in them. This book comes from a book that my mother bought when she adopted me in, in 1990. And uh, she gave me this book a couple years ago when I started looking through it. I found this poem. So I don't know if you if you had a chance to read it, but for me it's it speaks volumes for me. And this is uh Leno Lianlaf who's the older who's an older poet from a rural existence uh, from the twentieth century. And uh, as far as my study is concerned, this is a snapshot. It's very much a work in progress just starting to get into the poetry because what I focus mostly upon is the position of the poet in Chilean society, mm -hmm. what that means to them, and how they produce, and how their poetry is received. So have you all gotten a chance to look at it? Mm -hmm. This is a snapshot of David and Nier's poem. And both poems kind of deal with this, this feeling of connection. They're looking for this connection, this identity that they're looking for. Um, in David years, it seems to him like this connection is a lot further away that only comes to him in dreams. That he, A lot of his poetry has to do with just trying to connect because he's an urban Mapuche. I'm an urban Mapuche. I don't speak my language. I don't really know my history. Um, you know, I live in the city, very much American. <laughs> Love the town. <laughs> um, and so I really connect with kind of the urban poets because they all deal with this, this struggle for connection of identity in the face of a popular mentality that is trying to stomp them out, that is trying to say that they don't exist. And so, actually an interesting thing also is that when I was speaking to the professors in Chile, I learned that there are five main people writing about it in terms of you know, PhDs and scholars and all these other things. There have been two studies done. One study done in Santiago by a student, the other done in Temugo by a student. And that's really the only studies done by students about Mapuche poetry. Uh, and the one in Temugo was actually done by one of the poets when she was studying it. So really only one poet, you know, or only one study has been done by a student about poetry. And so here's this American slash Chilean slash Mapuche in Chile asking these questions about Mapuche poetry. And a lot of my interviews actually turned out to be questions more about me than of the poetry itself. <laughs> because I'm very interested to them, which is fun. <laughs> David Anenier and a lot of other Mapuche poets who are from an urban, more new context like to make up words. So there's this, this generation of made up words. Mapurbe is one of them, which mixes Mapuche, the traditional word, for people of the land, and the urban, urbana. Mapurbe is a mixture of those two. He says that Mapurbe is a culture that is in constant motion. It's a poetic concept of identity and part of the people's contemporary heritage. 
not be totally about you. <laughs> that's, uh, that's me in a nutshell. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the critics of Mapuche poetry also don't really exist. The Mapuche people themselves don't really entirely read the poetry. A lot of people, if you're going to study Mapuche poetry, you have to go into that academia. To the professors and the scholars, there's only five. There's only three in Chile, you know. There's only two outside of Chile that are studying it, so it's really hard to find a lot of information about it. Um, but the, I mean, that's so you get a sense of who is receiving this poetry. It's mostly scholars and professors, and also the poets themselves. And the poets like to read others' poetry and like to comment about their own poetry. So this is what Anir says about his own poetry. He says it's an ethnographic poetic testimony based on experience transmitted through stories, music, and visuals. Many of them which are identifying with this. Um, and then he says he's never he's never tried to understand the poet. His bond with his Mapuche ancestors is something which until now he can't understand. But through the ancestral legacy he has a sense of manifestation of strength and endurance. And I feel that as well. I'm Mapuche and I say I'm Mapuche. I don't say I'm Chilean, which is very interesting. Um, I say I'm Mapuche but I don't know why. <laughs> and I really just don't try to understand it, I just am. Which goes back kind of what Laura was saying. I've grown up, going abroad every year, back to Chile, meeting my family, kind of reconnecting with the culture of the region, and very much feeling this empathy, sympathy at times. It's been a process, very much a process. Um, in September, I'm gonna move down to Chile and start living with them, with my biological family on the reservation which is a big step, <laughs> but yeah. So cultural hybridity is my main point. It's what makes sense. There's, there's no such thing as purity anymore. You can't force things into categorization of purity. You have to look at it all as the traditional and the modern at the same exact time. And looking at the poetry, which I haven't quite gotten to yet, you can see a lot of different aspects of this. You see a lot of traditional beliefs, um, dream sequences. You see a lot of cultural aspects, such as the history and all this blood spilled during the uh, pacification of the Araucanian. But as well, poetry in itself is a very kind of modern concept. And it, I mean, writing is a very modern Western concept, especially for people who don't have a written language. You know, so it exists very much at the same time as in the past as well as in the, in the now. Uh, so Chatuma means thank you. <laughs> Gracias means thank you. Uh, and that is a picture of my birth mother and my mom in the U.S. who met in January while I was down there doing research for this project. So uh, I am very much a hybrid existence. <laughs> and if I wrote poetry, I'd be this urban hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> so 